tan distinguido, representante y precursor de todos los temas que tienen que ver con la protección de datos personales, como lo es Martin Abrams. Eh, yo les quisiera agradecer esta participación, tanto de servidores públicos, la colaboración que hemos tenido institucional con el sector privado, muy importante, y en especial permítanme reconocer la gran labor que han tenido las y los comisionados de los órganos garantes de la República que estamos trabajando hombro con hombro, conjuntamente dentro del Sistema Nacional de Transparencia y todas las acciones en pro de la protección de los datos personales. Es para el INAI, obviamente, a nombre de mis compañeras y compañeros integrantes del Pleno, por supuesto, a nombre de nuestro comisionado presidente, un honor organizar también este evento en aras de un derecho que nos corresponde tutelar y garantizar no solamente la transparencia y el acceso a la información, sino también la protección de los datos personales y también pues, mi reconocimiento a todas y todos los que participaron en la organización de este importante evento. Saludo con un gran respeto y también un gran afecto a Martin Abrams, director ejecutivo y jefe de Estrategias de Information Accountability Foundation, Cuenta con más de 35 años de experiencia y sin duda alguna es un referente internacional como precursor del principio de rendición de cuentas en la normativa en materia de datos personales. En su conferencia magistral, el interés legítimo en el tratamiento de datos personales sensible. Saluda a cada una y a cada uno de ustedes y sin duda es una distinción compartir esta mesa cuya experiencia y conocimiento han sido preponderante para los, todos los hacedores de políticas de protección de datos personales en Asia, Europa y América Latina. A manera de introducción de esta conferencia magistral les comparto algunos de los elementos de su amplísima síntesis curricular. Martin Abrams es director ejecutivo y jefe de estrategias de Información, Information Accountability Foundation. Su trabajo como innovador de políticas de información y del consumidor es reconocido internacionalmente. Su trabajo más reciente se relaciona con la gobernanza del Big Data y con el cumplimiento de las disposiciones en materia de privacidad. En el marco ético unificado para el análisis del, del Big Data, estableció las bases para la evaluación ética del análisis avanzado y para ampliar el uso del concepto europeo de interés legítimo. Dirigió el proyecto global para la rendición de cuentas, en el cual redefinió el principio de rendición de cuentas en materia de datos personales, contemplado en diferentes leyes de protección de datos y documentos de orientación. Confundió, cofundó y presidió el Centro para el Liderazgo de la Política de Información en el despacho Junto en Williams, el cual dirigió durante 13 años. Se desempeñó también como vicepresidente de Políticas de Información en la organización Experian y es director de Políticas de Información en Sistemas de Información TRW, en donde diseñó una de las primeras herramientas para la evaluación del principio de impacto sobre la privacidad y ha trabajado en los esfuerzos de Abrams se centran en la innovación. Uno de sus más grandes retos fue continuar buscando soluciones prácticas para asegurar el equilibrio entre la innovación informática y la dignidad personal de la Fundación para la Rendición de Cuentas y la Información. Y con mucho gusto y con un gran honor me han permitido ser parte de esta introducción a nuestro distinguido ponente, comentarle, señor Abrams, que bueno, pues hemos coincidido en numerosos eventos internacionales en aras de la protección de datos, que nuestro país ha hecho esfuerzos importantes en materia legislativa, en la materia, y sabemos el camino que nos falta por recorrer, sobre todo en los aspectos que manejas, que es el manejo ético también de la protección de datos personales y esa eh, evolución y transformación del consentimiento que todavía lo tenemos muy reflejado en México a temas de interés legítimo. Para el INAI, para cada una, cada uno de nosotros y especialmente para sus servidores, un honor que tengamos la oportunidad de escucharlo en esta conferencia magistral. Bienvenido. Oh, thank you.
thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, uh, the fact is that if you have actually no marketable skills, you think about data protection and you run a think tank. So I appreciate you um, bearing with me today. Um, one of the things that's been established is that I am old enough to have done all the things um, that were described. Uh, I'm 67 years old. I will be 68 in March of next year. Um, I have no desire to give up the driving of my car. Um, but I do have a desire for the driving of the car to be safe for me and my family. So the fact is that my next car is going to have um, anti-collision brakes. It is going to have brakes that if I don't stop the car, the car will be stopped. And for that to happen, the systems in that car, this computer on wheels that is the modern car, um, is going to have to observe the environment. So it's going to be looking out for things that I may run into and it's going to have to watch my behavior constantly to understand how I actually use and apply the brakes. So it's going to see what my normal behavior is, how I pay attention. It may even link with the sensor in the mirror, the rear view mirror, that tries to determine whether I'm paying attention or dozing off to see if there's something going on. And when it senses that the norms are not there, that I'm not behaving the way I normally behave, it's going to stop the car. It's not going to ask me permission to stop the car. It's not going to ask permission whether I am want to stop the car. It's just going to stop the car. And I actually think that that observation, this watching of my behavior in this context, is absolutely the right thing. I want that car to stop. I want that observational technology to work in my favor. But at the same time, I'm a person who's supposed to understand the policy implications of technology. The fact is that the car can sense how often it has to stop the car and not let me stop the car. That's incredibly interesting information particularly if it's blended with other information that might exist about me. So the fact is this, this observational technology that makes it possible for me be, to be a safe driver at the age of 68, because I'm going to turn 68 in March, could in five years help inform public authorities that maybe I am too old to drive a car, that maybe I'm not paying attention enough, maybe I'm too distracted. So the fact is that this observation that serves my needs and serves the public needs because I'm driving the car more safely is the same technology that can impact me in a different significant way in the future. And that's part of what we try to deal with here in the world of data protection and privacy. And my friends, that this thing does not work. Um, um, I'm sure that, oh, there. So there are key points that I want you to take away from this presentation. By the way, um, Enai is going to make my slides available so you don't have to pay too much attention. The first is that privacy is really hard for all of our stakeholders. The second is when we talk about sensitive, we have to talk about sensitive in a different way than we've talked about sensitive in the past. The fact is that the word accountability is a very difficult word in Spanish. I really understand it. But accountability is just being responsible and being answerable. And those words work in any language. Our observational world requires more governance. And there is a high level of global uncertainty today about how all of these systems are going to intermingle. So we've established that indeed I am Marty Abrams. We have established that I lead a nonprofit uh, organization. We've also established that I'm 67 years old. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I am a policy theorist. And part of what I do as a policy theorist is I give a lot of thought to what fundamental rights are. I've spent a lot of time thinking about what it means to balance all the fundamental rights that impact us and how they are impacted by the world of information. The fact is we want this increasingly digital world to work. The fact is that I want my smartphone. Who here in the audience has a smartphone? Am I alone in having a smartphone? 
I, I, I don't think so, okay. I want my smartphone to work. I actually want my smartphone, it just buzzed, I want my smartphone to work better in the future. When I'm old enough to have medical devices embedded in my body, I want those medical devices to work, and I want them to be interactive, and I want them to work interactively with the smart medicines that I take that alert the hub that I've taken the medicines and those devices have to work. I want the emergency braking in my car to work. I want this free cyber world to be paid for in some way. I know I'm exchanging data, I'm not always comfortable with it, but I want the cyber world to exist and I want everything to work better tomorrow than it works today. And the fact is that getting things right, getting things right, uh, let's change the slide if there's someone who can help me make this work. Okay, I will ignore the slides. Um, you should ignore the slide slide. The fact is we wanna get, thing, it, we wanna get things right. And getting where things right today is not a solo experience. It requires many parties. Again, going back to my smartphone, the typical app on my smartphone has six different controllers. I want those six different controllers to work interoper uh, inoperably. I want them to all act responsibly. And if something goes wrong, I have no idea whose fault it is. But the fact is that in this world of solo, nothing, you know, it's, we're not in a position of any single organization to operate. We work in a very complex thing. And we as individuals, we really do want to be in control. The fact is that I really want to determine um, who I am and how I'm defined. I want seclusion in my home. I don't want anybody to know what I'm doing in my home unless I want them to do that. I want to create my own community of friends and be able to define that. And most important, I want to define myself. Back when I was 19 years old, I used to drive a 55 Chevy, a fantastic car, to the Pocono Mountains um, late at night to get back to work after visiting with, with a young lady on the other side of the mountain. The fact is I drove that car with bald tires um, through rainstorms, which would mean I am probably the most irresponsible person in the world. If Eni had knew how irresponsible I was when I was 19, they would not have invited me to speak here today. So the fact is that we do indeed want to be in control. And the fact is that we spin off more data about ourselves at all times. Who here has a smart watch or a Fitbit of some sort? Well, I don't have a smartwatch because I can't figure out how to make it work. But the fact is that I would wear a smartwatch if I could. Do you realize that an Apple Watch takes your vitals every six seconds? Every six seconds. That's a lot of rich data. It t if you could associate your vitals with the other things you're doing, that would be really cool, right? We send our DNA to genomic services because we want to know about our heritage. That's incredibly sensitive data. We consent to our location being used all the time. It used to be, I would ask the front desk at a hotel, where's the drugstore? Now I go to, to, to be honest, I go to Google Maps and said, say drugstore near me and my phone guides me to that location. Um, the fact is that even in the United States, a lot of people let their phones monitor their TV watching um, so that someone can know which commercials they're watching. The fact is that we are the source of lots of data, but it's not data that we think about the fact we're providing. And when we think about the fact that all of that data is part of a data lake, um, that's a really interesting concept. Um, there is a project um, that was going on at NYU, New York University, a fine university, and it was trying to track the nature of people over time and uh, over generations. And they had to test the technology, and part of the technology is everybody in the project is being issued a smartphone, everybody has wearables. When they began to test the technology, they found there are certain behaviors that have a specific data track, a data signature associated with them, and that if two staff people who seem to be attracted to each other, all wearing the technology would particularly engage in this 
fairly intimate contact, the fact is it created this register of what they're doing that was recorded someplace and became sort of an issue in the development of this technology. The point is if you're, if you're having hanky-panky and you don't want a divorce lawyer to understand that, please take off your watch. So, so the fact is that, that this data lake is really full of data that is not sensitive, but when we bring it all together, it has sensitive implication. And that means that we really, we really don't have rule, fixed rules about how to define what is sensitive data. We have laws that says, uh, say that these pieces of data are very sensitive, but the fact is it's the context around that data that really makes that data sensitive. It's not just the nature of the data itself. The rules are no longer the great guide in what's sensitive. And later we're going to discuss about how we go there. And as we think about the migration of technology, the fact is the first really disruptive technology for privacy was, was 6,000 years ago back in the year 4,000 or so. And that's when the writing was in, invented in ancient Sumer. And it was, and it was in, Venton to give greater power to those who were in control so they would be able to keep records and chronicle what was going on. And the second major disruption was paper, which made it much easier to keep these records. And we go on and on and on. But the fact is the acceleration of technology that is privacy sensitive has really been since World War II and specifically since 1970 when the whole concept of relational databases was first documented. And the fact that this acceleration of technology goes on, and the fact is we have real difficulty keeping up with that technology. And probably the, the, the single technology that changed things the most was the adoption of consumer browsers back in 1993, but it wasn't the last. And the world of artificial intelligence is taking us to, to new places in terms of how we have to think about information governance. So privacy is much harder. For people like ourselves who are trying to manage our lives, it is just harder because the first thing we want is we want to make our life better. So we want to wear smart, smart watches, we want smart phones, we want our car to be smart, all of this requires observation, and observation in itself creates risks to us being able to manage our identity. We don't want what makes us feel uncomfortable, so we're not comfortable with the fact that we're being tracked, even if we're comfortable with the effects of it. So the fact is that maps can't work when we're, when we're trying to, to, to get from one location to the other without the fact that that tracking must exist and we wonder how to manage the complexity. Um, my wife says she's very privacy sensitive, yet she has three Alexa devices in the downstairs of our house that are always ready to answer her questions and to improve themselves, they have to know the types of questions she asks. So the fact is that one of the ways of managing this complexity is just not get up in the morning, stay in your bed, leave all of your smart devices, but that's really not a great answer for most of us. And for policymakers, and I know we have some legislators here today, policymakers, it's getting much harder to, as well. Because the fact is that if you are in Canada, as an example, they want artificial intelligence to generate new jobs tomorrow. They want digital growth to be a generator of growth. They also, and we find this in Mexico, national security is an important issue. We want our citizens to have individual control and how do we balance that with national digital growth and how do we legislate in a holistic manner which balances all of those interests together at one time. If we're regulators, what is it that we police? Do we police individual empowerment? Do we give individuals control? Or do we police the fair data use, the use of data to create value? Do we encourage organizations to be more thoughtful or do we enforce with an iron hand? Those are difficult questions for regulators to deal with. And the fix, in a long slide, um, and for companies, it's not any easier. So for a company, 
Do I free data to drive innovation? Is it in my best interest to have the best products and services? And that requires the ability to think with, with data. Do I mechanically comply with the laws? Do I just say I'm just going to comply and if I don't understand how to do that, I won't use the data? Do I respond to competitors' initiatives when they're more aggressive than mine? Or do I get frozen by the fact that I can't figure it out so I won't do anything with data? And you come to this last word, this question, is it better to be labeled a gravy-sucking pig in the newspaper for overusing data, or is it better to have my lunch eaten by my competitors? And that's a significant question. And this slide, which nobody can read because it's at a distance, I'm just trying to illustrate what you find in that gray area is our ability to understand uh, our, our, the fact that we have to use data in a fairly aggressive way and that the laws and the norms are following at a slower pace. And that gap there is the risk that we are going to use information in a fashion that is inappropriate, and if we don't use information aggressively, that we won't create the value for others that we should. So how do we make sense of this? How do we cure the chaos? Um, I don't really have any great answers, but I'm going to uh, make some suggestions. Ah, sorry. So the first is that we need to understand that privacy as a concept has two components. And European law actually makes it easy because it breaks it apart into two components. The first component, and it's linked to the fundamental right to privacy in Europe, is the concept that individuals should have autonomy and should have complete control of knowledge of family life. And the fact is that's the traditional concept of privacy, that we as individuals can define for ourselves what should be done with our data. And that's increasingly hard to do. Data protection is how data impacts the full range of fundamental rights. The full range of things that are important to people. The right to better health care, the right to better education, the right to, to the benefits of technology, the right to, to the benefits of an growing economy. And so data protection is much more holistic and looks at the full range of fundamental rights. And I spend a great deal of time thinking about what that means to look at the full range of fundamental rights. I've asked many regulators over the years, what does, that what does that phrase mean in European law? And the fact is they talk around it because it's a hard thing to come to grips with. In Mexico, the concept of privacy is equivalent to the European concept of data protection. It includes the full concept of using information in an empowering way for the full range of fundamental rights. And people have really diverse rights. They have the right to education, health care, economic opportunity, but they also have the right to have a space where they can define themselves, where they're not completely defined by the digital dust that they live, live, leave behind. And how you balance them is a situational issue. And you have to figure out how you get to the right situational analysis to make that work. And that means that policy needs to be effective in a different way. When we first envisioned privacy as a policy right in 1967, that's right, 1967, three years before the concept of a relational database was developed, we looked to this concept that individuals would selectively hand information over to a controller for a limited purpose. And the concept of consent comes from this concept that I am the controller of my data, I hand it over for a limited purpose. That worked well for about three years until the concept of a relational database took off. And indeed, the gap has been accelerating uh, over time. In Europe, the concept um, the, the concept, and I think that's, the concept of consent is a big driver behind the way that their new data protection law, the GDPR, has come into play. But the fact is that consent is the basic building block that we've tra traditionally built into privacy. And I want to say something about the fact that there is a competitive advantage to being a U.S. information technology company. 
And I want to talk for a minute about what that is. The United States have a, has a unique structure. And what's important about that unique structure is that the U.S. covers the actual application of information, not the processing of information to come up with insights. So the fact is, as an American company, I'm free to process the information to come up with insights. It's only typically when I apply those insights that privacy law comes into play. In almost every other jurisdiction in the world, including Mexico, the moment that I touch the data and do anything with that data, that's a processing that must be um, uh, permitted by the law or by individuals with their consent. And much of the work I have done over the last seven years is how you bridge this difference between the American concept of thinking with data is a free good, it's the application of data where we come in together. So as we think about how these come together, the observational world and, and, ad, and advanced analytics that thrive off of it, it just isn't going to go away. If you think it's going to go away, then you think that that smart car is going to go away or improves, improvements in medical devices is not important. So fairness becomes a major concept. And fairness is really about the impact of what we do with information. It looks at the benefits and the potential harms, um, and it looks for, a, a, it is increasingly looking for this concept of a robust fairness that meets the needs of all of the stakeholders involved. And the fact is that we go back to this concept of thinking with data. We need to find a way in public policy to make thinking of data possible in a protected way so that we can get the value that comes with it and more aggressively regulate and oversee the actual using of data. So the fact is that accountability is a old concept. It was part of the OECD guidelines. And as you all know, Mexico is part of the OECD. Um, but it was something that was ignored pretty much until Canadian law actually added accountability to the law in 2000. But they pretty much ignored the concept of accountability. It was in 2009 that a group, a multi-stakeholder group, that included regulators and business and civil society got together and came up with the essential elements of accountability where we began to put some structure around the concept of accountability. It led to the European regulators in 2010 taking those essential elements and putting them into the context of European law. Canada pushed guide, um, published guidelines in 2012, which are probably the best regulatory guidance that I've seen. Those guidelines in Canada have been adopted in Hong Kong and in Colombia, um, so they, they're, they're very useful. And in GP, when the Europeans passed the GDPR in 2016, the concept of accountability is distributed throughout them. And ENI was, played a major role in the development of the Iberia American Standard, and the American Bar American Standard adopts the concept of the responsible organization, which is really the Spanish translation of this concept of accountability. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time talking about the essential elements of accountability. You can all read them, they've been published, but they're really the first is that you have to have an internal policy as a controller that links to external criteria. Second, you actually have to have the mechanisms to put them in place, which including assessing the risks that are associated. You have to have a system for internally monitoring, monitoring what you do to make sure that it's effective. You have to be transparent, and you have to have mechanisms for individuals participating in the process. And last, you have to have a, a, a system for making good if you screw up. So if you, if you harm someone with data, you have to stand ready to, 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 to um, fix what went wrong. And accountability made simple. It's not that difficult. Please just remember, it's being a responsible organization 
If you're a public sector organization that has data, this counts for you as well. You have to be a responsible organization and you have to be answerable for your behavior. So that means you have to be open about what you do with data and why you do it. And as we think about this concept of, of moving away from consent, putting more of a, of, of, of a, of a burden on, on accountability, when we look at European law as it was enacted in 2016, we move away from this concept of consent being the most important or only means for providing permission for processing of data. There are actually six legal bases and the fact is if you're an organization you should use the correct legal basis. So the concept of consent should only be used when the individual actually has the ability to affect the processing with their consent. If the individual can't do that, one of the other legal basis needs to be used. And as we think about this concept of how you put that into effect, we find out that the real key issue is assessments. And the fact is the what you do to analyze what you do with data to determine if it's appropriate and then create the documentation that allows you to show others it's appropriate becomes the key factor in the management of information. And, um, and, that would be in, 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 and the concept of, of assessments is a concept that's being built out um, in a fairly rapid rate. Probably the country that has moved, moved fastest in that is Canada. And in part, Canada moved faster because of the guidance they put out in 2012 on what it mean, meant to be an accountable organization. And we now see Asia looking for the central role of assessments in part to assure that they can move forward with digital growth based on things like artificial intelligence. Um, and I'm going to actually skip this slide. So the fact is to guide the determination of what's appropriate, particularly in the world of big data, in the increasing world of, of, um, of artificial intelligence, you need to move beyond fair information practice principles to principles that get you to the full range of fundamental rights. And we articulated five. Now the fact is everything has to be in fives or threes because those are magic numbers. Three was too few, so we had to move to five values. And the first value is beneficial. Whatever you do with data needs to balance the benefits you create for the stakeholders involved along with the risks. And if you have a system where companies get all of the value and individuals have all of the risks, that's obviously <clears throat> something that's out of balance. What you do with data has to be better than if you didn't do that with data. In other words, if you're going to use data more aggressively, it really does have to improve the environment. What you do with data needs to be sustainable. In other words, if you can use data to think with data, but you can't use it to act with data, then it's probably not a sustainable process. And if I have insights, those insights only have a limited time. I need to understand how effective and lengthy those insights are. What I do with data needs to be respectful. Every piece of data comes with obligations associated with that. Those obligations no, don't go away. Respectful means I have to be respectful. And last is whatever I have to do needs to be fair. And that's the determining factor. Everything comes together to say if what I'm doing with data is fair. And as we think about regulators increasingly looking at this concept of was that processing fair, this is where the assessment comes down. This is what a regulator can go to to say, show me that you determined what you were doing with data was fair. Now, we had to test this. And this is a concept. Um, I, let me go on. Excuse me. OK. We needed to test the concepts that are in those values. We were asked by the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada if we would apply for a grant and would we conduct a project that would create a way for big data 
to be legal and actionable in Canada. And we therefore then recruited 20 companies who were willing to work on that project. We went through three meetings defining how you take these five values and apply them to the assessment process. We then brought in a multi-stakeholder group that included um, the regulators, consumer advocates, academics, and based on that, we, began, we wrote a paper. So everything, of course, when you do a public grant, has to require a paper. So what did we learn? The key findings were that there were links in Canadian law, which has two pillars, one being consent and the other being accountability, that, that allowed us to create more robust assessments for advanced analytics. We found that this concept of requiring the controllers to assess both the benefits and risks to all of the stakeholders and identify those stakeholders was really an uplifting experience for the businesses. Understanding all of the parties impacted improved the quality of what they were doing. We found that this methodology could be transferred everywhere. We've actually gone forward and transferred to the concept of legitimate interest in Europe and we've got a, a number of countries in Asia that are interested in, in this concept, and I tell you that it would be transferable to Mexico. What we came to, out of this is that we needed a proxy for ethics, and the proxy for the ethics is the concept of legal, fair, and just. What you do with data can't be blatantly illegal. That's pretty obvious. What you do needs to create real value for all of the stakeholders, and you need to understand what that value is, and there can be no hidden discrimination, and just is the concept of hidden discrimination. And we found this proxy for ethics actually works in a cross-cultural way. However, when we finished the project, we realized that there was still an issue, and that issue is trust. And why is trust an issue? Well, we live in a world where there have been some bad behaviors over time that organizations will do what I call putting their thumb on the scale when they do assessments. So does anybody remember going to, well, I guess nobody here remembers going to the butcher shop when they were a kid. I do. Um, when you go to the butcher shop, what you're always afraid of is that the butcher would put his thumb on the scale to, to, to take what was in balance, out of balance, for his own benefit. So the fact is that there was concern that this process was not transparent enough and how could you uh, begin to oversee a process that would begin to, to move us uh, towards instituting trust. And the fact is that we are currently doing a project in Canada that's on that question of trust where the concept of, of um, ethical review boards can be applied to this concept of overseeing assessments. So let me give you a global perspective because the folks who mean I asked if I would do that. The fact is that for the next five years, the Europeans are going to set the tone. They have enacted a new law called the General Data Protection Regulation, and they have a concept of adequacy that tries to create a level of equivalency between data management in Europe and data management every place else. So the concepts, including this concept of six legal basis to process, is going to be a dominant feature um, for the next five years and is going to impact the transfer of data from Europe to Mexico. The fact is that there's also a developing concept of how do we get a better balance between growth and data protection and I think new concepts in that area are going to come out of Asia and they're going to have impact in the way from a public policy perspective that we think about all of this. And so let's get back to the fact of sensitive. The fact is that the concept of predefining what will be sensitive just by saying some pieces of data are sensitive because they are, is no longer sufficient in the observational world we live in. The fact is the actions of individuals and the inferences that we raise about them create sensitivity based on context. 
which is part of the reason that assessments become such an important um, uh, part of it, pro the process. And it also at the end, since we are here at a session sponsored by a regulatory agency, it means that regulatory agencies in this world where context counts, where, we, where we're trying to um, use the concept of fairness to counterbalance the loss of autonomy, it means that regulators are going to have to revolutionize the way they oversee the market. And with that, I want to thank you for being a wonderful audience, and thank you very much. Marty, eh, muchísimas gracias por esta, por esta plática realmente inspiradora. Creo que nos has dado muchos elementos de reflexión. Primero, cómo la tecnología va avanzando a pasos agigantados, pero no es solamente la tecnología, obviamente, sino qué hacemos cada una y cada uno de nosotros con esos avances. El papel que tiene el sector privado también de cómo aprovechar esa gran cantidad de información que va teniendo eh, día con día, prácticamente segundo a segundo, el papel también de los legisladores y de las autoridades de todo el sector público en ese manejo de la información, pero sobre todo el avance que ha tenido bueno, conceptos tan importantes como el consentimiento y lo difícil que es a veces para el mismo individuo otorgar su consentimiento. Y en el caso de México, bueno, pues ya eh, con una gran satisfacción de un trabajo que se ha hecho por el área de Relaciones Internacionales, por la comisionada también Patricia Cursain, ha sido formalmente invitado para adherirse al convenio 108 del Consejo de Europa, que creo que es un avance eh, muy importante en materia de datos. Todavía nos falta mucho por hacer, el INAI como, esta, como parte de, de pues una agencia que nos dedicamos también a la protección de los datos personales como organismo eh, constitucional autónomo. Tenemos un gran compromiso con la población, tenemos un gran compromiso también con los estados de la República de difundir una materia tan importante y un derecho fundamental consagrado en nuestra Constitución, pero sobre todo darle vigencia. Realmente inspirador tu plática, Martin Abrams. Eh, ha sido un honor institucional y para nuestro país tenerte nuevamente con nosotros y pues eh, disfrutar de, esta, de este trabajo tan responsable y comprometido que haces en materia de protección de datos personales y en temas tan importantes como la privacidad. Muchísimas gracias por compartir con cada una y cada uno de nosotros tus conocimientos. Gracias. Agradecemos a nuestro conferenciante y se le hará entrega de un reconocimiento por parte de la comisionada Jimena Puente de la Mora. Brindémosles un fuerte aplauso. Agradecemos a Martin Abrams por acompañarnos, por compartir sus experiencias en esta materia y a la comisionada Jimena Puente de la Mora por acompañarnos en esta conferencia. Damos por terminada la conferencia magistral. Invitamos al público a continuar en sus lugares y acompañarnos en las premiaciones eh, de innovación y buenas prácticas en la protección de datos personales y del primer concurso nacional de cuento juvenil de ciberconvivencia responsable. Muchas gracias. Tainted love, tainted love Don't touch me, please, I cannot stand the way you teased I love you, though you hurt me so Now I'm going to pack my things and go Once I run to you 